Some people will be removed. Oh, what's happening? I'll wait till they come back. Uh, so I'll kind of filibuster a little bit by saying welcome to the final lesson of grade 12 biology that you will be assessed on at least. Because um, like I said, on Monday, I will still do some population dynamic stuff with you. It's a little bit more self-directed and for your learning only. So I will assign it. It's in that folder. Uh, and I will connect you to that folder um, when the time comes. But we'll look at some of those lessons on Monday. Uh, just to go over some of the scheduling with regards to the day today, we have this final lesson that we'll complete hopefully in about 15 minutes or so. I'll give you time to ask all sorts of questions and uh, to digest the material. Ah, there's Raheem. And, um, and so we will finish this lesson up and this unit up. I will post the quiz at around 10, 10, 15-ish. And then I'll give you until 1.30 to finish the quiz. So about three and a half hours you'll have to, to write that quiz. My hope is that you've digested the information from yesterday. And all you really have to do is incorporate this new lesson into that learning and those understandings. And um, as a result of that, hopefully everyone should be in good shape for the quiz today. So uh, now that we have everyone back who was here before, let's get started with lesson nine, senses and stress. And we're going to look at the specific aspects of sensory receptors with regards to the afferent system. Recall that the afferent system is part of that PNS, right? When you think about the peripheral nervous system versus the central nervous system, please make sure you're able to differentiate between those two. So that sensory information received by those five senses that we know and love so much is communicated via nerve impulses to that central nervous system. And as I was talking with Sissy earlier, we have very specific senses that are very specific to very to, that are that are specified to very specific nerves and neuron groups. So it's important to recognize that these five types of sensory receptors uh, are are consistent throughout our entire body, and they're responsible for those general five senses that we talk about uh, in in life in general. So the first one are mechanoreceptors. Those mechano oh, that is my fire alarm, folks. My apologies. The test in the fire alarms. Alarms. Be a test. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> good timing, folks. Thank you, for your okay, I might. We'll see. I think that they usually only do it for like a minute or two. Um, so I'm going to just keep forging ahead. And then if it gets a little noisy, we'll just stop and then uh, we'll keep going. So, mechanoreceptors. As the name suggests, mechanoreceptors are responsible for detecting mechanical energy. So they look at seeing all types of different types of, of pressures that are exerted on the body. So that kinetic energy or the mechanical energy that our body can detect uh, comes in multiple different forms. But those mechanical receptors or the, those mechanoreceptors are going to discover or sense those types of signals and again send it up that pathway the next one is photoreceptors those photoreceptors are going to look at detecting and differentiating between the wavelengths of light such as the retina is one aspect of photoreceptor they are very very specialized and incredibly intricate and it's one of the hardest things for for us to replicate when it comes to looking at creating technology uh, that can mimic the photoreceptor so photoreceptor is looking at light detection Chemoreceptors or chemoreceptors are going to look at chemical changes. So you're looking at taste, you're looking at um, different types of skin detection in terms of um, uh, sensor, uh, sensitivities towards that type of stuff. So uh, it, ultimately, it's looking at chemical change to the body and to any system that's regards to it. The number one thing is usually that tends to do with taste. Uh, and it's interesting to kind of think about how food tastes as a result of chemical components of that food. And when you think about your favorite food, i.e. french fries for myself, I think about the, the fats, the starches, the sugars, the salts that are responsible for making it taste so good. Those are chemoreceptors that are helping me make sense of that. Thermoreceptors, as you can imagine, are going to look at temperature change. It's going to detect if it's hot, if it's cold, anything in between. Uh, and so they're pretty interesting in that sense because, again, I, I, I will harken back to this often. Each of these different types of receptors are connected to very specific nerves, which are connected to very specific interneurons. So they are responsible for having a very specific result if one of these receptors are stimulated. 
And then the nociceptors are responsible for pain. These prevent function damage to tissue. So any type of pain that is sensed as a result of these nociceptors will tell you, hey, this hurts, stop doing whatever it is that's leading to this being caused. So sensory adaptations are pretty interesting because in some systems, uh, the effect of a stimulus is reduced as it continues uh, at a specific type of constant level. And it does this because of many reasons. But the one example that I want to give you uh, is that the, the feeling of covers in bed or bright lights when being in the dark, these are temporary insensitivities, right? The more consistent you get used to them, or the more consistent they are and the more you get used to them, and the more they become kind of like background noise to what those sensors or receptors are used to feeling. So, you know, when you first get into bed and you feel the covers on of, of like your bed, you notice them, but eventually that receptor level kind of decreases as the stimulus is consistent. So it's going to continue to reduce until you don't even really notice that those covers are on you. Uh, the same thing with regards to seeing a bright light for the first time in the morning. At first, it's like a huge shock, and then your body kind of adjusts, and those uh, photoreceptors adjust. And so that temporary insensitivity uh, is only temporary. In some sensory systems, the receptors maintain that sensitivity. So it's important to recognize that that maintenance of that sensitivity is very important as well. So while our bodies can reduce that stimulus, sometimes it will maintain that sensitivity. And one really good example is pain, because it's going to allow us to identify that damage that's happening, and then we can respond accordingly. So if that pain continues, it's probably a, uh, a way for you to say, hey, I need to probably stop doing that. So that those receptors, those noci receptors, they maintain that sensitivity. They do not reduce, at least not right off the bat. And it's in an attempt to really get used to the idea of adjusting to reduce that sensory input, whatever that sensory input may be. So when you think about stress, which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with, Stress is a component of uh, homeostasis, and, and it's interesting to view it in that way because it's the response to that specific stressor or stimuli, right? And it's going to initiate a change away from homeostasis. So when you think about when you are, in fact, stressed, uh, it's really just your body responding to a stimulus, and it's going to attempt to change that stimulus to reduce that homeostasis imbalance. And, at, right off the bat, it may not necessarily be that, but it does take some time to kind of acclimate and recognize those stressors or those stimuli. And then again, that they're changing away from that normal homeostasis and the processes that are looking to return to homeostasis. So the response to stress, for the most part, are quite uncomfortable, um, but they are one of the body's evolutionary defense mechanisms. At the, at the end of the day, when we talked about evolution in terms of senses and homeostasis as a whole, uh, being able to avoid stressors uh, help you to survive. Now, uh, just like we've talked about that conversation at length in terms of uh, evolution kind of working against us, our body's desire to avoid stress can now be seen as a counterproductive or counter-evolutionary aspect because it can prevent us from achieving and attaining certain things. So it's interesting to think about stress being important, but also um, when we talk about stress, we're talking about both physical and mental stress. It can be any type of stress. Stress is not just one lump sum category. Uh, there's multiple different aspects of it. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with mental stress, but when we talk about stress, we're talking about the general umbrella term here. So what can some causes of stress be? They can be physical stress. They can be psychological or emotional stress. They can be short-term. They can be long-term. We can talk about that sympathetic response as well, that fight or flight aspect, right? Recognize that they are going to contribute. That stress is going to contribute to the response of that system itself. So when we think about short-term stress, they are short-term, brief stressors. Once they are removed, the stress response ends, there is usually an immediate response. It's that fight or flight response. There is danger, I get away from the danger. Once the danger is gone, I start to feel less stress. The stress response ends. This is good for survival. It really helps with regards to removing oneself from a dangerous or potentially um, harmful circumstance or situation. Long-term stress tends to be a little bit more of a trickier thing. It is a topic of conversation we only briefly cover, but it's that repetitive stressor component. It's going to add to itself consistently over time, repetitively stressing out the system. And in that repetitive stress response, you'll start to see um, heart diseases, type 2 diabetes, decreased immune response, decreased attention, digestive issues. Long-term stress over a long-term period of time can have severe negative impacts on the entire body because again, 
it's uh, impacting that ability for homeostasis to kind of return you back to that normal. So every time you start to see that return to normal, that stressor comes back and then it rejigs you out of homeostasis balance. So that consistent stress can start to lead to several different issues as a result of it. So what are some ways that stress affect our body? The first is that uh, you need to think of how responses to long or short-term stress will work because it's important to recognize that short-term stress and long-term stress have a hugely different impact on how the body responds and how your body responds. So some stress hormones we'll talk about. Uh, the first ones are epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are adrenal. These are adrenal hormones. They're from the, the essentially the adrenaline um, adrenaline steroid component. Uh, it's interesting to think about how they work because when you think about adrenaline as a whole, it's going to promote the conversion of glycogen to glucose and fats and fatty acids. This will increase energy supply. And when you have that surge of adrenaline, you really want to try to increase the amount of energy that your body has access to. Why? Because it's normally in response to a fight or flight. So epinephrine also will dilate blood vessels, open airways, allow you to get even more oxygen, more sugar, more nutrients to things that you need to uh, feed at this current point in time. So that's that um, That's that uh, energy increase, right? So when you think about that glucogen, it's going to convert that glycogen to glucose, right? Don't think about it um, in terms of the actual uh, glucagon and uh, insulin. Don't worry about that. Just recognize that this adrenaline converts uh, the stored glycogen into energy uh, digestible things for your body to consume. So that epinephrine is really going to um, have redirect energy usage. So it's taking all of that energy that would normally be for that rest and digest component and it's utilizing it for the fight or flight. Norepinephrine will increase blood pressure and it will also affect our attention centers in the brain. So depending on how the pathways work, it might help, it might decrease it, it might increase it, uh, it might have no impact. But ultimately these uh, adrenal hormones are really in an attempt or as a response to some type of stimulus where your body says, I need more energy to make something happen in the fight or flight response. Cortisol is one that comes up quite often when you research stress and, and hormones that are responsible for stress. It's gonna promote the conversion of glycogen to glucose and fats and fatty acids as well. It will increase blood glucose and fatty acid levels, and it will also speed up, speed up breathing and heart rate. But if you notice, it won't do anything with regards to uh, blood vessels and, um, and uh, opening up of airways. It's just going to increase the rate with which you breathe, breathe and increase the rate with which your heart will beat. Glucagon and reduced insulin, again, we've talked about glucagon and insulin as hormones. The stress response to these things are different. So when it, recall, glucagon increases breakdown of glycogen into glucose to increase that blood sugar, while insulin produced is going to decrease. So this is a type 2 diabetes example in the context of having too high of certain levels of either of these um, insulin or glucagon. In this example, we're looking at insulin production being decreased as a result of stress and uh, glycogen uh, being broken down as a result of that glucagon. And that's, again, all in, an, uh, in, a, in a response to stress. So when you think about type 2 diabetes being caused by some stressors and some stressful factors, it's important to recognize that when you are stressed, that you do see that uh, insulin decrease and that glucagon increase. So it's important to think about that context. And then last thing that stress has an impact on is that ADH, that antidiuretic hormone. It's which impacts the reabsorption of water. This will cause, like I said, that retention of water by the kidneys to increase. And then as a result of that, you'll see that increase in blood pressure. Now, when you have an increase in blood pressure, that can lead to specific cardiovascular diseases uh, and it essentially that can, can cause some type of heart attack. So again, you think about stress and the impact that it has on all of those different hormones that we've talked about, and you can start to see how stress can have a negative impact on the body. We're looking at um, several different means with which uh, the impact can hit you as well. So we'll look at a specific example here where we are going to look at the short-term stressor and the impact that it has on uh, a specific gland as well as long-term stressors. Uh, but the important thing here to realize is that that brain will identify the stressful situation. I know we didn't really talk too much about how the brain specifically works. Again, 
It's a little above our pay grade, so I won't go into too much detail with that. But ultimately, that identification of that stressor as a short-term stress response uh, triggers a short-term stress response or a long-term stress response. So if it's a short-term stress response, cells in the hypothalamus will help signal those nerve cells in the spinal cord. Those nerve cells in the spinal cord will help activate the adrenal medulla, which will secrete that epinephrine and norepinephrine. And if that short-term stressor can be removed by an increase in um, all of the things your body needs in order to fight or flight, it will do that. And that's, it's very important to recognize that it's going to allow for that focus of blood flow uh, to the necessary organs that are responsible for fight or flight. So you're going to get out of that situation, circumstance, whatever it is, that short-term stress response really helps you respond to that and get out of it as best as possible. The long-term stress response can have a little bit more of a different pathway. Again, the hypothalamus is still responsible for sending and releasing those hormones to the different areas. The, the anterior lobe of the pituitary secretes uh, a specific hormone that activates the adrenal cortex. And it really depends on the type of response that's needed because it, it can really mitigate and change some type of things, right? I talked a little bit about those glucocorticosteroids, steroids um, like glucagon. It's going to look at changing the way your blood sugar levels uh, respond and it can, you know, decrease that insulin, increase that glucagon. It can also have an impact on what's something called the mineral corticosteroids or medical corticoids, um, like ADH, where you're looking at water reabsorption changing. So again, when you compare and contrast the long-term versus short-term responses, it's important to recognize that one is really meant to get you out of a certain, uh, certain circumstance or situation and get you out of that danger, so to speak, using the fight or flight mechanisms. Whereas the long-term stress response is a little bit more messy. It's not quite sure what it needs to do. So it can have a number of different impacts as a result. All right, folks, that is it for this lesson. Thankfully, the fire alarms did not go off again. I'm gonna stop the recording here and we will answer questions as we need to.